Well, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar from uh, the Open Group, uh, which today I'm very pleased to say is uh, concentrating on service or in cloud computing infrastructure. Well, thanks very much, Simon. Um, I'm Chris Harding. I'm with the Open Group. I'm the Open Group Director for Interoperability. And uh, my role in the Open Group includes supporting the work of our members on cloud computing and on SOA. So uh, I will give a bit of background at the start of this presentation um, on the Open Group and the work that we're doing in those areas. Uh, and then hand over to uh, Nathan and Tina, who will describe the technical details of the service-oriented cloud computing infrastructure framework uh, and how to use it. Okay, so you can see, I think, the agenda on the um, on the screen now. Um, after Nathan and Tina have told you about the SOCI framework, um, then we'll go on to a wrap up and questions. So the Open Group. Uh, is a consortium of um, companies that use or create uh, information technology solutions. Uh, and the vision of the Open Group is boundaryless information flow, which is the idea that information should be able to be available within the enterprise and the extended enterprise, that's to say the enterprise's customers and business partners, um, as needed and when needed, um, and this should be achieved through global interoperability in a secure, reliable, and timely manner. And uh, we see enterprise architecture as a key way in which boundaries information flow can be achieved. Um, so we, our mission is to drive the creation of boundaries information flow we work with customers, we work with suppliers, and with consortia and other standards bodies. Uh, and uh, we, working with these customers, suppliers, and consortia, uh, we understand requirements and we uh, evolve and integrate specifications. And we're going to talk about one of those specifications today, the Service-Oriented Cloud Computing Infrastructure Framework. Uh, we also offer a comprehensive set of services uh, to other consortia, uh, and we are also um, the operators of the industry's premier certification service. And uh, we do work on uh, encouraging the procurement of certified products. So there's a broad spectrum of activities that the Open Group undertakes uh, in carrying out its mission. We're Vendor and technology neutral, uh, we're an international consortium uh, and uh, membership is open to all enterprises, small, medium and large, anywhere in the world. So how do we, how do we operate? What do we do? Um, we have uh, membership, uh, and as I said, we are open to membership uh, by companies of all sizes anywhere in the world and those memberships collaborate in forums and work groups, and I'll be saying a little bit about our SOA work group and our cloud work group. Uh, we also hold conferences four times a year. Um, I've just come back from the last one, which was in Cannes, France last week, a very pleasant uh, location and a very good conference. And we hold regional conferences in various parts of the world. Um, it looks as if I will be going to one in Saudi Arabia next month. Um, also, we hold them in South Africa, um, China, India, um, South America, a number of places. Um, certification, I mentioned uh, we certify people principally in the architecture field as being enterprise architects uh, and solution architects and with their knowledge of the Open Group Architecture Framework, TOGAF. Uh, we also certify products, in fact, our original certification program was in the policing that we do of the Unix trademark, which we own, to certify that operating systems uh, are fit to use this, uh, the Unix name. Um, wireless application protocol, architecture tools, uh, we also have certification programs for those and also for training services. Um, <clears throat> and as I think I mentioned a little earlier, we um, provide collaboration services, our expertise in running consortia we offer as a service to other consortia. 
So finally, we get to SOA, Service Oriented Architecture. Um, we have um, the SOA work group is set up to enable our members to work on things concerned with SOA, to develop SOA specifications and to foster the use of SOA. It's been going now for, I think, over six years, um, actually seven, I think, um, and we have uh, 400 people participating from 70 member companies. Um, and you can see on the right a large list of completed projects, which now includes Soki as the latest one, um, the areas that we're working on uh, still SOA and cloud security. Actually, legacy evolution since last week should be moved to the right-hand side too because we've just published the uh, Open Group Guide to Legacy Evolution to SOA. Um, and we are starting up, uh, we have started a project on SOA for business technology and we're looking at a further iteration of the project that we undertook to describe how to use the Open Group Architecture Framework to do SOA. So the SOA work group is a mature work group. It has completed projects um, defining a, a reference architecture standard, a maturity model standard, a governance framework, um, uh, a practical guide to using uh, TOGAF for SOA, and now the service-oriented cloud computing infrastructure framework in conjunction with the cloud work group. So uh, it is a mature work group. The cloud work group has been going only for about two years. Uh, so you see that the list, and I haven't called them completed projects, but projects with completed deliverables because the, most of those projects are still working on further deliverables. Um, and a much larger list of developing projects that have not yet um, created their deliverables yet. Um, the main thrust of the cloud work group is on the understanding of use of cloud computing to gain its benefits in enterprise architecture. It's now a larger work group than the SOA work group, both in terms of the number of participants and the number of participating companies. And it was the SOA and the cloud work group that got together jointly to develop the um, service-oriented cloud computing infrastructure uh, framework. So. Um, I think this may now be uh, an appropriate point to hand over to uh, our experts, but just to say that this is the first cloud standard that we have produced. Um, it's produced jointly by the SOA and cloud work groups. The SOA work group had produced many SOA standards. This is the first one the open group has produced on cloud, and it lays out the concepts and architectural building blocks for infrastructure to support SOA and cloud and it was developed by members of the Open Group SOA and Cloud work groups, um, including HP and IBM and also other companies. But the two co-chairs of this project were Nadan from HP and Tina from IBM. And I think this is probably an appropriate point to hand over. I think is Nadan going to, um, to take it from here? Thank you very much, Chris, for that um, overview on the open group and where the SOA and cloud work groups fit in. My name is Nadan. I am one of the co-chairs for the service-oriented cloud computing infrastructure project, uh, or as we call it, um, SOCI. And um, Tina Abdullah from IBM is the other co-chair. She is on the call as well, and uh, she will be chiming in and also speaking to the, some of the other slides that come later. Uh, but basically, uh, it is the two of us that uh, co-chaired the Saki project and are taking it to the publication of the first technical standard, which we will be walking through today. Um, I must say, just to give some context as to where uh, Saki started, uh, to elaborate on what Chris said, um, we really started within the SOA work group. Uh, it, it was uh, born, I must say, in concept as the service-oriented infrastructure project. And uh, simultaneously, or uh, you know, towards, I want to say, midstream, um, the cloud work group evolved. And uh, we had very healthy discussions on, well, when we are talking about service-oriented infrastructure, the cloud is so pertinent to that domain 
that uh, it was kind of common sense that we basically applied to uh, evolve what what started as service oriented infrastructure into service oriented cloud computing infrastructure that will provide uh, you know additional context as to why this became a joint project both between the soa and the cloud work groups and to the uh, third bullet on the slide uh, i cannot stress enough the contributions of uh, the different uh, members of the team representing various companies, uh, the open group itself, and you will see the details uh, within the published guide that for which you have a link in this deck as well. With that, uh, if you can go to the next slide, Simon. So one of the questions uh, the open group challenges itself with, which we did in this case as well, um, whenever, you know, like all other projects, we have to justify for ourselves um, why do we need to work on the project and also what are the goals. And in this particular case, since we are talking about a new technical standard, what's the need? Is the market really asking for the standard? And when we did the analysis uh, at the time Saki started, and perhaps uh, true to some extent even today, there are many prevalent standards that have been there uh, for SOA uh, for many years now. And cloud standards have also emerged, and there are uh, quite a few around that we do interact with uh, that uh, Chris was talking about earlier. However, when you look at the intersection between SOA and cloud standards, um, are there standards for infrastructure being provisioned? So the, the application of the service orientation principles is something that we have been doing um, a lot in the application space, but not as much in the infrastructure space. That kind of evolved later. And standards take time to evolve. They don't, you know, it's not like you get the standard first and then the world starts doing things. It's the other way around. Therefore, uh, uh, what we found was that really there was no technical standard that applied to the, the, the incorporation of service orientation principles in the infrastructure domain. And voila, Saki. That's really how that came about. So what is Saki? It's really the, um, basically the, the realization of an enabling framework of service oriented components with infrastructure in mind so that it infrastructure can be provided as a service in the cloud. So what is really happening is you know, we are capitalizing on the emergence of virtualization technologies, the SOA principles being applied to infrastructure, and thereby offering infrastructure as a service when it is in the cloud. That's really what the hockey framework is enabling. Basically, uh, what you are seeing here, and I would encourage everyone to subscribe, to the open group blog where there is a constant feed of really insightful posts by different members of the open group. And um, what you see here is a post that actually details, uh, there is a press release, that's the, the first link, these links are live. And you also see a post about you know what was involved in the uh, first technical standard, that's the second bullet. And then uh, basically this is uh, the press release statement itself saying, you know, it outlines the concepts, the architectural building blocks, and we will get into detail on the Saki standard uh, in, in, the, in the next few slides. This is where I would hand it off to Tina. I would also, so we are going to kind of chime in as we deem fit. So Tina, please feel free to weigh in on the earlier slides, but uh, do take it away from here. Okay, thank you, Nada. And first of all, thank you everybody for joining the call. Um, as we say, this uh, th this work product really is is combined efforts with using a lot of previous work from the uh, service oriented infrastructure groups, and as well as uh, I want to point it out, we have other work groups that are working in concert, uh, such as the security and. Uh, others um, team that we, we didn't want to really to, uh, spe to specify it in detail in this uh, standard because we believe those groups, the work groups, which in the open groups, they have produced their significant uh, work products, which is, uh, can give you much more in depth. So while we walk through here, I would point it out uh, as our uh, 
fly going through uh, some area that um, potentially uh, you would you would have to go through and other work groups to find more details, such as the security itself and, and other governance per, per se. And as Chris said in his uh, earlier um, opening statement, um, we we now have a, a start of some other project, including a cloud computing uh, governance project, which Nada and I are leading. Um, we we will go into much more further detail in depth in terms of address some governance area. So with that in this slide, what you're looking at is basically extending what the um, SOI, uh, service-oriented infrastructure, into the cloud by uh, uh, leveraging um, Saki as a foundation. Um, and as we know, the cloud computing uh, puts a new demand on the IT infrastructure and management in an abstract manner. It, and a cloud computing provider needs to support multi-tenancy. Uh, in, instead of for individual subscriber now, they have to provide uh, more course grant services uh, to help maximize and utilize the resources, dynamic allocation of resources, and metering with the chargeback, and so on. And we we are actually starting out using in our uh, paper when we start. We try to uh, leverage what NIST has published the, the cloud computing characteristic. Uh, you know, which I've, I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Again, what I was trying to say is uh, we try to examine what is available in industry and take what is the, the most um, acceptable standards and try to use and versus building from scratch. And we use the the NISA standards, I mean, the, the, the characteristics defined by NISA, such as on-demand self-services, broad network access, and so on, um, resource pooling. But because the, special, the specific differences and unique difference between cloud and uh, service-oriented infrastructure in some way is um, the, the, in the dynamic poolings and provisioning and so on, uh, we thought that Saki will be able to bridge the differences to extend from the SOI that which has been um, done in an open group previously, they have uh, uh, papers that if you guys uh, are willing, you can actually uh, get from the open group side. Um, some of the things are very similar, uh, like uh, we were talking about um, using the services uh, and, and, and as a foundation like a building block to provide some operational transparency to potentially to the subscriber. But it's not for the uh, single subscriber here. We're talking about uh, multi-tenancy here. So that uh, way to be able to provide a chargeback, to to be able to automatic provisioning become extremely important. Um, and why is uh, SOI does not offer the whole spectrum of the characteristic design, is become an enabler for Saki, okay? So Saki is a service-rented, as we say, and utility-based, manageable, scalable on-demand infrastructure that can support essential cloud uh, characteristics and service and deployment models. So, in other words, the Saki does describe the essentials for implementing and managing the infrastructure as a services environment. So, I'll emphasize here also particular much more infrastructure per, per se, not to try to go beyond uh, in, in large uh, other areas such as the business processes, the cloud, and so on. Um, as IAS may entail the provision of multiple components, including the server uh, for on-demand computing power, a facility for robust web hosting, and also elastic storage. Those are the characteristics which NIST has identified. Uh, here you can see um, a sort of a high-level view of what we're trying to uh, denote in terms of what is the Saki is about. Um, it's as you can as you see here the the there are governance which is really trying to manage to providing a guideline to overall mm -hmm. Saki, which is going to be described much more in detail in the in the cloud governance groups, and which I welcome everyone can join it. And then we have a security that it to ensure that everything applied here is uh, complied to the security compliance and and, and can support from the service uh, service subscribers from based on the SLA and and so on. 
And the really the key, the core piece here you're looking at is elements of sake, which I will give you a little more detail uh, to describe each piece. Elements of sake um, is consists of compute, um, which is can be um, you know uh, hypervisors and everything which use it to help to do the compute functionality. And but it's not in the physical pieces; much more in the virtual, virtualized manners and the storage and network and facility and so on. Um, and then we are trying to be um, much more focusing, since I said, in the infrastructure pieces. So we are trying to standardize or make it much more simplified um, as an open group is uh, as much more um, vendor neutrals and you know product agnostic, uh, provide you a view that uh, allow you to see, uh, to use all these elements of Saki, there is a cloud computing um, sort of management platform which, is, which consists of um, managing building block. We have this business perspective as well as operational level, uh, a separate building block which interact with the user, external user, uh, on the business level and the operational level, the building block is interact with elements of Saki. So um, as we moving forward, you can see um, th that those building block, as we right now seeing uh, on the screen, they are also to support sets of users from their perspective. So um, we do not include the base of, uh, you know, some of the like service registry uh, or nor um, like service registry for registration and publishing services or orchestration, composer, uh, choreographer stuff. That's because uh, it's, it's because the availability of so, uh, uh, ABB is implied here. So we are assuming that it's already been provided. We also, um, as I said, um, we're talking about discuss the management building block is directly related to infrastructure that supports socket, right? So some of the broadly used cloud and IT services management related components such as service catalog and compliance policy managers are also excluded from the list of cloud components because we, we, and, and final detail like SLA, service level agreement, those all imply in the building block. So assuming the location managers, let me talk about from the, this common building block because they are the enabler to allow the user to use uh, this, the element of Saki. From the business perspective, the location manager um, the, it would then uh, help to geographically locate the resources uh, based on some of the business processing rules and regulations and cost constraints and service level agreement might be different uh, from different tenants. And then the, the billing in, and also um, you're looking at a meter manager, they actually work together in some way because uh, the meter manager, uh, managers, we track the usage because in, in the virtualization space, uh, how much usage you know each uh, tenant share is uh, critical to identify and then be able to do the chargeback and later on, which is that provide information to the billing managers. Um, so those are the high level building block that really to expose those services that infrastructure level to the user, uh, which is, you know, they subscribe the services based on specific contract and maybe geographic uh, business legal legal requirements and so on. So uh, they manage on the upper level and they work with operational building block. In this case, it's, um, we have virtualization managers, which you look at it, that is really provide a resource dynamic pooling um, allowed you to emulate a physical infrastructure component, um, you know, any parts of this elements of Saki. It is also uh, act like a facade and a manager for physical infrastructure elements of Saki within, the, within this uh, framework. Um, then it's important to know in that because it's sharing the environment, we have multiple tenants. We provide this monitoring and event managers that can help to monitoring the different services. 
and the event and trend of usage to see which there's any conflict, whether there's alerts need to uh, initiate it to trigger based on some defined, previous defined, some of the rules or processing abnormality, and then make correlated uh, network and resource assets, ensuring the compliance and reporting any problem potentially. Um, this is also important um, to, um, to in, in sense, simply to indicate how one uh, that is the best way to propagate a clear any incidents. Um, if we moving the model from the point as um, in cloud is much more proactive because we needed to provide this automatic kind of automation to proactively to monitoring to detect at a need to using monitoring event manager is critical to measure the mean time between failure and mean time to repair and, and the, with any uh, potentially configurable alerts that so the, it, the, the user which is subscribed to the service can immediately get notification and escalate uh, automatically of any problem or issues. For the provisioning managers, um, it provides the rapid elasticity and on-demand self-service enable enable and they, the, it, it, the functionality of this purpose of this manager is really to making sure that the right number of resources allocate and to balance among all the different tenants ensures how to uh, address the fluctuations of uh, the demands um, in, in the virtualization space and, and also provide um, optimized uh, the infrastructure's resources while satisfying all the customer requirements. So they would then um, go through all these elements of Saki to uh, locate, uh, to I mean, to to be able to locate the right resources for the storage or facility or network. Those are sort of wired by like in the data center, and in data center, for a lot of com company now basically outsource out in because of the, the the benefit of the cloud provide not only trying to maximize the utility space to the model and also trying to. Um, uh, can benefit not let uh, the server to be idle, so they can maximize their investment and also, uh, you know, cut costs. So this provisioning manager is really doing that functionality to help it to be able to dynamically allocate things to support uh, the need and 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 share the resources in the virtualization space. Then we talk about capacity and performance managers. And that's where the pooling comes out. And, and then when you need this provision, they will get talk to the capacity performance um, manager to making sure that the performance is satisfying based on the subscriber uh, SLA. And also uh, it has enough to scale dynamically in the virtual space. Um, configuration, man configuration manager is, is critical because it's out allowing to manage multi-tenancy in the space uh, provide ver uh, versioning and configuration support, whether it's a virtual or physical within the infrastructure. It, it also supports um, provisioning and monitoring event manager within the infrastructure to ensure the overall functionality and integrity of this infrastructure. So as we say um, in, in large setback, all those from the picture, as you can see, there are uh, three a primary user viewpoint, which in our paper we describe um, in, you know, I'm not going to go so more in detail, but as the very left-hand side, you see the consumer and the end user, which is the cloud uh, services consumer. They have a some sub road, which is service integrators, consumer business manager, and so on. Um, we also, uh, on, on the other hand, we have service developers that is actually put, create, developing the services that are needed um, for for the you know for use for consumption. Um, service providers, which is basically leverage what of uh, developed services and deliver those services, cloud services as you can see uh, with this business process services, the software, the service and platform, and so on, um, to um, the service um, uh, consumer, the cloud service consumer. 
um, we we do have a, a sort of a hybrid uh, user view, which is not shown out here, but is implied, which is integrators, because a lot of uh, times that um, between um, the, the established the SOA or between the consumer and the provider, uh, there will be a, a service integrator that playing a role uh, somewhat to making sure that to match making the services needed to provide to the subscriber. Um, and but it's not necessarily is is a mandatory role, more like a hybrid or optional role. So we're not showing here, but in our paper we did describe what a, the the some sub role that it it provides. So as a whole, um, our emphasis here is trying to keep a very simple uh, sort of a building block kind of a component view that allow. Uh, the, the folks which needed to start establish some kind of uh, service in uh, infrastructure layers in, in the cloud and know what would be essential, some of the building block they need to address and to be able to uh, support the, the business operations and, and, and their project. Um, so I'm not going more in detail, but uh, there are more uh, obviously fine uh, um, more in depth, um, you know, detail in the description, which in the paper I welcome everyone get a chance to read through if you have not done so. Okay, um, we use a model car uh, here as sort of trying to tie in what a building block we use, um, give you a sort of sense of in realization how you realize those uh, building block and the components in the real world, and this. Uh, you know, race car is a simple way. If you see in the middle sitting here, which is in the green line, those are the integrator. As a sort of, of course, remember this is a, a one scenario. There might be multiple scenario that can um, be derived from our uh, Saki, but we try to try to take one example, which is just a, a very simple example to show you. Uh, assume there, assuming there is a, a cloud integrator that has developed a site that to provide a motor car information to the subscriber when they want us to see what's race information, they want to put information out. This uh, integrator then um, talk to the providers, the race car provider for multiple different sites uh, geographically or, or, and, and, and that they can assess information and display that to the subscriber based on the level of their subscribing level, whether it's gold or, or bronze or, or, or silver, uh, let's assuming the different content will be displayed and they also um, somewhat to, uh, to check and monitoring the usage and then allow to work with the billing managers uh, to build this uh, based on the consumption and usage which is the subscriber use. Um, they, in, in this case, uh, the, as you see, some of the legend uh, uh, dash lines is providers that potentially can be technology uh, from ISV and uh, or motor car SaaS provider has some specific software uh, uh, that they need to stream to dis the, uh, display the, the motor car stat statistic and also maybe uh, provide some analysis or anything which is reporting which it needed to. So, I mean, in, in NASA, obviously, uh, there are sets of uh, services and that can be, um, it, it depends on which subscriber w w has subscribed previously, and then they will provide those services um, and to each uh, subscriber um, dynamically allocating resources and providing based on the service level that bronze or silver or gold, uh, different type of, uh, of um, performance and different type of uh, service uh, agreement based on contract and legal uh, compliance and so on. Yeah. So, uh, in addition to what Tina said, I just wanted to share with everyone how this scenario came about. Um, I wish I could say that, you know, there was a scenario that we conjured up that exactly matched the uh, realization of the building blocks. It was actually an iterative exercise. So, for each building block that Tina walked through in the framework on the previous slide, 
the way we would go about it is, okay, let us see where could the virtualization manager be used? Where can the configuration manager be used? And is there a real life, um, or at least you know, uh, from an application perspective, is there a, 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 an aspect of this scenario where we can highlight that? So what you will find in the paper is the scenario itself, but in addition, you will also find how and where the building blocks Tina walked through uh, has been applied or can be applied, which is why you see multiple levels, uh, you know, the gold um, uh, consumer, and, and you, you see regional content like EMEA versus uh, other regions where there could be some compliance laws and so on. We also try to address uh, the availability. So that's why you see a primary and secondary provider, provider for IAAS as well as uh, the technology providers that can be a fallback. And then going back to the roots of Saki, just to consume services in the strictest sense of the word, you have the content provisioning service, which is what you see uh, in the bottom and uh, top left. So just wanted to highlight those aspects and um, um, emphasize that we have made a sincere effort to not just call out the technical and architectural aspects of what Saki is, but also ensure that there is an application in a business scenario. Hopefully, this would facilitate your application of the standard in your environment. And uh, perhaps there are some you know, multi-tenancy. So here you see a service integrator accommodating multiple tenants. Let's so think of different auto racing companies provisioning videos and using the same environment. So, you know, such characteristics, I would assert, can be applied in other scenarios in other industries as well, which we are hoping will facilitate your application of the standard, which, which is a good segue. Um, I mean, our first challenge was, okay, why do we need the standard? And I had spoken to that earlier. You saw what the standard is which is great. But now you may be going, so what? How do we use this? So this is really uh, speaking to the steps that you can take to apply this standard in your environment. For starters, it actually uh, embraces the foundational principles of service orientation. And by the way, in the paper, you will see a section that talks about what the basic SOA characteristics are. You will see the NIST characteristics for cloud highlighted. And then you will see a section that kind of brings the two together, kind of a one plus one equals three paradigm where you will see synergies that cannot be realized without the coexistence of both. You can judiciously apply and extend the traditional environment and enable the provisioning of infrastructure in a service-oriented fashion in the cloud. That is to say that you know it is not that you know cloud is the answer for all the infrastructure to be provided as a service. We recognize that there may be a healthy balance that need to be struck. So you can apply the standard to you know extend the adoption uh, in that manner. Like Tina showed, you know what you think about the cloud, how how you perceive it, really depends on who you are. And what I mean by that is you know what your role is, which is why. In the diagram that Tina spoke to earlier, you will see on the periphery different viewpoints. So you can actually, uh, and in the paper, we have not really gone into the detail in this deck, but in the paper, you will see the viewpoints themselves detailed out. So depending on who you are or what your role is in the enterprise, you can apply that particular viewpoint using the standard in your environment. The other piece is that you know, today you may have an architecture solution in place. Uh, or you may be in a position where you are about to implement um, a cloud-based approach in the enterprise. Either way, the list of building blocks, the business and the, uh, uh, the technical ones that uh, Tina walked through, they can serve as a good checklist at the very best, where you can validate, you know, do I have the virtualization manager? Who is going to do the metering? Is there a billing component to it, and how is that being handled? So, you know, th what this is promoting is a way to ensure that you have a well-defined, finite set of building blocks 
which will better enable you to do it right. Now, in the event you already have a solution deployed in the cloud, that's fine. But there again, you can use this as a validation list to see do you have all those pieces in place. I would assert that if you are missing some of these foundational building blocks for Saki, you will be encountering some challenges, you know, if not now in the future. There are certain areas that may not be as effectively addressed. It may even not be, you know, the same list, but at least if you ensure that the functionality that Tina spoke to for each building block, if that is manifesting itself in your architecture, that will be a good validation. And then you would have, um, you know, there are different models uh, for deploying this. It could be uh, private, it could be public, it could be hybrid, and you can actually implement, you know, apply the standard in all cases. We have really not localized it to any particular implementation. In fact, we recognize that, you know, the business and technical needs would drive the type of environment that, uh, you know, is best suited for you. So really the standard is agnostic to that and really applies in uh, all the scenarios. And then I spoke to the business scenario. Now, Tina had uh, mentioned this. It is just calling it out. Uh, we recognize the need for governance. And uh, in fact, we almost started. Uh, you may find a passing reference to uh, governance. Uh, and, and we started uh, as the Saki governance. But uh, it, it didn't take long to figure out that, well, this needs to be done really at a cloud level. And uh, I would reiterate the call to everyone interested who are attending this webinar and others who are listening to the recording later, please consider if you are interested in the cloud governance space, which Tina and I believe, and certainly the Open Group believes is one area where we need to uh, detail it out and add some clarity to it, uh, please feel free to uh, join the project and contribute to your thoughts. So this is kind of uh, taking you behind the scenes um, and, you know, uh, in the event you are on other projects that are in flight, maybe this would be a good, uh, you know, at least we are sharing our experience. When you're seeing the end product, but here is what, uh, here are the different steps that we went through. First off, we identified, you know, we've, we asked a so what question. So what if we brought SOA and cloud together? That is step one. The next step was to identify the building blocks. And then um, we did uh, take the step to you know, ensure that the SOCI framework is actually in alignment with both the SOA reference architecture that has been published, as well as the cloud reference architecture, which is an in-flight project. So you know, we had to answer ourselves the question, not just us, but also working with the SOA and cloud reference architecture project, where does Saki and the, the building blocks of Saki fit in in those uh, architectural layers? So that's the, it was a very critical step actually. Step four was the motor cars uh, business scenario. And step five, like Tina was talking about earlier, is recognizing the fact that, you know, it's not just Saki, there is security and uh, other areas that are being addressed across the open group, which uh, you will find the detail in the SOA and Cloud Workgroup project slide that Chris walked through earlier. So identifying the connection points. These are basically references. You will find the actual publication. You can download the um, Saki framework itself. Uh, there is a press release, related blog posts, and yes, uh, shamelessly, Tina and I are putting a plug for the governance project. That is really what you see at the end. We, uh, uh, we really think that this is an area that needs to be evolved. Um, and we have had, there is good content that has captured, but a lot more work to be done. So we certainly look forward to your active participation and contribution to the cloud governance project. And uh, if you reach out to us, we also came up with a, uh, you know, a list of things, uh, list of areas that could be expanded upon. We did ask ourselves the question in the end, okay, this is Saki. What is Saki++? What is Saki 2.0, so to speak? You know, are there areas that could be elaborated and so on? So um, we have compiled that list and would be more than happy to share if anyone of you want to work with us to take the initiative and then take it to the next level. 
But before opening it up for questions, uh, let me check with Tina. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add before we jump into Q and A, Tina? Um, yeah, just to uh, to to emphasize one thing is about the governance. In our current Saki paper, we do have a very uh, small write-out uh, trying to describe the the governance because governance is sort of uh, cross-cutting one of those discipline area. It, like security, it's, re, it's really it's not just uh, limited or just to uh, you know infrastructure or sake uh, per se, but it's so important. Now, one the reason I'm pointing out is because the virtualization the, the really if from the perspe subscriber perspe perspective is it, it's uh, providing this product agnostic things. So how the governance. Uh, be able to help to decouple the technology with product, and how to be able to uh, to robust, uh, ro really robust track the records and and especially the SLA, including um, security and so on, and and providing some somewhat centralized that visibility to the user by either by reporting or dashboard so on. And I, I would just strongly recommend that it's not trying. We're not trying to shortcut, not to sh to describe in our papers, because of the importance. We try to make it actually a separate study groups, so we can drill in more further down. And I, uh, as, as Nadon said, um, we both strongly, um, you know, welcome anyone uh, participate today in our call to join a working session to to provide that that uh, level of details to our, our, in the governance area for the cloud computing. So that's all I want to say. So, all right, thanks, Nada. Thanks, Tina. Simon, um, I see some questions in the chat room. Um, let me just scroll up to it, by the way. And this is from uh, Kaldeep Dervesh, and he's, and he's asking, he's wondering, what would be the implications of leaving the cloud computing and the SOA as individual frameworks having their own principal best practices, etc.? And he just explains that he says because these topics could overlap with other paradigms. Um, for example, you could use SOA on a non-cloud infrastructure, or similarly, you could have a non-SOA on a cloud infrastructure. Has anyone got yeah. any response to that? Yeah, let me speak to that, and I would request Tina to weigh in as well. Um, absolutely. The, we are not suggesting that the SOA and cloud frameworks cannot exist on their own or should not. However, as we are looking at this slide, I will point uh, Kuldeep and others to the second blog post, which is the telltale signs of SOA evolving to cloud. And I, I'm doing that because you will see uh, that you know the fundamental principles of cloud really have stemmed from what SOA incorporated, and it behooves us to at least see what are the synergies that could be realized, and if there are, why not? Why leave it alone? So we are not suggesting that they shouldn't be used in isolation. I can see instances where they could be. At the same time, we should recognize, acknowledge, and capitalize on the synergies that we can gain as enterprises in this industry so that you know we don't lose out on the benefits. So that, that's what I would say, Kuldeep. Uh, Tina, did you have any? Uh, go ahead. No, I, I think that's uh, what you have said. That's, that's what I, I, I felt as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's excellent. So I think we've, uh, if everyone is in agreement, that's probably is a good time to uh, uh, end this presentation. Um, I would just like to say thank you to everyone that's participated. Uh, say thank you to all the three presenters and just say if you've got any final comments, would you like to say any final comments, folks? Final comments really is um, we really believe that, um, you know, the technical standard, this being the first technical standard, even after publication, we have not seen anything come across. And so we really believe that the open group has filled a gap. Um, that has been in existence, and it kind of evolved. It's kind of like, you know, as other standards were evolving, this gap was slowly, you know, it, it was very apparent. 
and the open group has certainly addressed the gap. However, the standard can only be as good at it as its level of adoption. And therefore, consider this to be a call for serious consideration by the enterprises represented in this call and others to see if and where you can adopt this standard. And, you know, so unless we actually implement it in the enterprise, we, you know, we cannot grow. So the whole idea of the open group is to work with that extended community to evolve, continuously evolve the standard. So your feedback by application of this standard would be fantastic. Uh, Tina? No, that's uh, well well said. Thanks. I want to thank everyone participating in today's call, as well as I want to thank Chris and, and Simon. Okay. Thank you once again, everyone, and uh, look forward to seeing you at another event in the future. Thank you, and goodbye.